Señores, señoras y señores, en breves instantes. Ladies and gentlemen, we will start the event in a few minutes. Please take a seat. al acto de conmemoración del Día Mundial de Lucha con... Welcome to the International Day against uh, desertification and droughts. Our motto for this year 
is raising up together from Drott. This act event will be presided by Pedro Sánchez, president of the S Spanish government, accompanied by Teresa Rivera, vice president and minister for the environmental transition and the demographic ch challenge, Jose Manuel Alvarez, foreign minister, European Union for, and for the European Union and international cooperation, and Jose Luis Escriba, minister for inclusion, social security and migration. In order to start, I'm going to ask Ibrahim Tiab, Executive Secretary of the UNCCD, the United Nations Convention Against the Certification, to uh, take the floor. I am going to speak in English. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Your Excellency Pedro Sanchez, Prime Minister of Spain. Your Excellency Teresa Rivera, Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Ecological Transition. Excellencies, Ministers, Excellencies, Ambassadors, Mr. President of the UNCCD COP15, I can't see from here, okay. Um, excellencies, ambassadors, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends. I am delighted to welcome you to this event marking the global celebrations of the 2022 Desertification and Drought Day. A day officially declared by the UN General Assembly in 1997. A day that seeks to share innovation solution, innovative solutions to ensure lives and livelihoods are no longer lost to drought. A day when each of us can participate in actions that increase our collective res resilience because every action counts. There is no small action. There is only inaction a day to celebrate the progress we are making and to inspire each other to act now to build the resilience of present and future generations. We all know it. An ever-growing number of countries and people are being affected by drought globally. Let me illustrate what I mean. Half of the world population is, is, is expected to face severe water scarcity in the next eight years. Consequently, as many as 700 million people, about 10% of the world's population, are at risk of being displaced during that period. Drought is set to increase in severity and frequency. Think about this. The consequences of drought can affect up to three quarters of humanity by 2050. There is nowhere to hide. If we are unable or unwilling to avert the severe alterations we are inflicting on the planet, let us be prepared to confront the new reality. Drought is a natural hazard but we can avert the humanitarian disasters that are unfolding in our very, very eyes in some parts of the world. As we speak, the situation is dire. At least 26 million people are struggling for food in Eastern Africa, following four consecutive poor rainfall seasons. Make no mistake, no country, rich or poor, is immune to drought. Spain, our host for this year's Observance Day, painfully knows this. From the United States to Australia, from Mali to Mexico, from Madagascar to Canada, droughts has multiple nicknames. 
forest fires, and I'm so sorry with the forest fires that are occurring as we speak, and, for, and firefighters are fighting day and night to stop them in Spain. Forest drought has multiple nickname, nicknames, forest fires, I was saying, food and energy shortages, forced migration, civil unrest, water rationing, to name but a few. We need to further build our resilience to droughts. When climate, with climate change, they are likely to appear more frequently, and when they do, they to hit harder. In this sense, commitments made by countries to restore one billion hectares of land, of degraded land, are a step in the right direction. Indeed, we need to protect and manage the land. Without healthy and productive land, livelihoods and jobs will become increasingly precarious. Uh, precarious. Younger people will be left without, with fewer prospects. At the last UNCCD conference in Abidjan, the 197 parties decided to act on drought together, another step in the right direction. They agreed to establish a new intergovernmental working group on drought, which is responsible for identifying concrete policy actions. There is high hope that at the next conference of the parties due for 2024 in Saudi Arabia, parties would agree on a meaningful policy action to mitigate the growing impacts of drought. Just a couple of weeks ago, the US government announced its plan to elevate drought and water security to a strategic international policy level. This is inspiring. Prime Minister Sanchez, I want to thank you for, and the government of Spain for your great hospitality. In particular, I want to thank you for helping us remember that yes, droughts and their effects can be devastating, but they do not have to turn into human disasters. Preparing in advance is far cheaper than reacting and responding to impacts after droughts hit. We should therefore set up effective early warning systems and mobilize sustainable finance to improve drought resilience. The good news is we know what needs to be done to drought-proof our future. But the time to act is now. As the rallying call for this day is rising up from drought together, let me conclude with an African proverb. If you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. So together, let's go, let's go faster and further. I thank you very much. A continuación intervendrá. Now we will have Patricia Combo, founder of the Patri Initiative and land hero of the UNCCD, the United Nations Convention Against the Certification. All protocols observed, excellencies, distinguished ladies and delegates, and my fellow young people. My name is Patricia Combo. I am a United Nations Convention to Combat the Certification Land Euro from Kenya and the founder of Patri Initiative. It is such an honor having this opportunity addressing you as a youth representative from Kenya, Africa, and in extension to over 40% of global youth population. Drought and Desertification Day is not a moment to celebrate, 
but to painfully bear what people, billions of people are experiencing every day due to land degradation. And millions of people who have lost hope and all is left is looking as vast lands turn into wastelands. I grew up in a, rural, in a rural village in Kenya. And growing up, I saw healthy lands transform into deserts. And I remember my parents used to sell surplus food from agriculture to cater for my education. And today I can say I am a product of land and health soils. But for the period I've stayed in that community, I have seen things transform from bad to worse. And now we are entering a moment of self-destruction. The land, the village that everyone took proud of becoming an agricultural basket is now a jungle. Nothing is left but masses of land which have transformed into nothing meaningful. And I remember every August, power source were competing, making the loudest noise as the community cleared trees to expand for agriculture. If you came in my community, smokes would welcome you as people cleared bushes. And with time, everything has really transformed. The fertile lands that we took proud of, they are no longer any meaningful. And from that, I realized drought is not a pandemic like how corona came, but drought is a process. It's a process of unchecked human activities and also ignorance of scientific advice that we have today. Excellencies and distinguished guests, from 2019, after watching drought attack my immediate community and having to endure the pain of waking up and all you see is vast lands, waking up and the temperatures are over 40 degrees on your skin every day. 40 degrees is not just a number on your skin every day. Waking up and the next moment when it rains, everything is lost. In my community, livestock die every season. During dry season, they dry because of starvation, because everything is dry. And when it rains, they die because of floods. Our soils are very weak. In 2019, I started Patri Initiative. And this is an initiative that I started to give up and resilience to my community. I work with women and children, and we are doing a lot of land restoration and kitchen gardens, at least to give up to people and to secure their food systems to end famine. Because if you've ever starved, you know what it means going without food. And through land restoration and working on farms, I can tell you we can together end drought because land restoration is one of the most effective ways and communities are willing to explore, to explore restoration because every day they interact with land and they know what it means lacking water. I know majority of you, you've never come across drought on, a one, on, on one person, but I would like to tell you how drought feels like. Clean and safe drinking water is like a diamond. Three meals a day is a dream. Every day you wake up and what you're thinking, what am I going to feed? We sleep in fears. Our communities have turned into violence grounds because we are fighting for the only available resources. We are fighting for water. A woman has to walk 14, over 14 kilometers looking for water. And what they bring home is dirty water. But it gives us hope because that is what we can take. Excellencies, today I would like to tell you that if we rise up together, we can combat. And in the past, people thought drought was an African issue. But today I want to tell you no country is prone to drought. Every country is now experiencing drought and Im or impending desertification. And no country should stand and say, we can act. The time to act is now, and acting means early preparations. In COP, UNCCD COP15, I had a chance of speaking to ministers and presidents, and what I told them and asked them is, any single inaction of any leader policymaker or any person 
will never be forgiven by young generations because I am bearing the brand. I am in inheriting degraded landscapes, something that I did not resort them to. And today, as we commemorate this day, I would like to tell you what rising up from doubt means to me. It means feeling in your heart what we people in dry lands feel every day. Bearing in your mind what people in Somaliland and in East Africa, who, who today are in their fourth year of consecutive drought feel every day. Picturing a child born today and the fate of their future in a community where everything is vast. And after you feel it in your heart, you will be able to rise up together. You will be able to take single actions as an individual, as a young person, as a policymaker, as the prime minister, and together you'll make Spain a better place where a young child born today is very proud of the land and they know that the future and the next generation will have a land that they will call home. And I would like to leave you with one spirit, with one quote. And it says, in the spirit of Ubuntu, we cannot rise up when we do not have togetherness. And it says, I am because we are. And if you believe in that, together I am so sure we will rise up together and end this slain called drought and desertification. Because if we fail to take action now, if we fail to rise up together, if we fail to embrace the spirit of Ubuntu, the next pandemic will be drought. It will be more worse than what corona we felt because millions and livelihoods of people depend on land. The food we eat, the air that we breathe, the cloth that we are wearing, all these are courtesy of land. And if we fail to take action, drought will not only affect livelihoods and food systems, but we will feel the impact on public health, transport, energy, our economies because our economies rely on the land. And if we fail to take action, every day we will not be talking about livelihoods, but we'll be talking of lives lost. So any action taken today, it will ensure a life is saved, a livelihood is secured, and a livestock, both wild and domesticated, are kept alive. Will you rise up together for drought? Thank you. A continuación, se proyecta. And now we'll watch a video with a speech by Virginius Sinkevicius, the European Commissioner for Environment, Ocean and Fisheries. In a, In a crisis, crisis we we'll we'll listen, listen to, to the science. Desertification is becoming a massive crisis, crisis, with fertile, with fertile lands, lands turning to dust, to dust all, around, all the around the globe. At a recent, At a recent UN, UN meeting, meeting, over 130 countries, countries voiced their concerns. Concern. Europe, Europe is suffering, is suffering too, and not, and not only in the, in the south. south. Every, Every year, 15% of our land area, area and 17% of our population are now, are now affected by drought. By drought. These, These numbers climb higher every year. And the fundamental reason is clear. Our, Our actions, actions are warming, warming the planet. planet. At the, At intergovernmental, the intergovernmental panel, panel on climate, climate change, scientists, scientists speak of a brief and closing window to secure a livable future, future that, has that has to start, start with cutting emissions. emissions. We, have we have to go carbon neutral. neutral. But there are, but there are many, many other, other areas, areas where we can we turn can things turn around. around. Those, Those scientists, scientists also call for urgent, urgent action, action on ecosystems that have, that have been degraded. degraded. And, they and they tell us we do we still, do have, still time. have time. So in, so in addition, addition to higher, to higher targets, targets for emissions, for emissions the, commission the Commission is preparing, is preparing a, new a new law on nature, on nature restoration. restoration. It's a new, it's approach, a new approach to bring, bring nature, nature back into our lives and to, lives and to and repair part, part of the damage we created in the past. It comes with EU-wide targets and specific actions for particular types of landscapes. 
That includes, that includes for, instance, for instance, restoring, restoring wetlands, removing, removing obstacles, obstacles so rivers flow so freely, freely, and ensuring, and ensuring that, that flood plains can play a role. Play role. By retaining, By retaining water, like, like a sponge, they can, they can lessen, lessen the impact of both, both floods and droughts. Drought. Because, because when we, when work, we work with nature, with nature and, not and not against it, it we get we multiple, multiple benefits, benefits for, climate, for climate, for people, for people and, nature. and nature. We need to, we need step, to step up, up the, implementation the implementation of these nature-based nature solutions, solutions and, cleverly and cleverly combine them with technology and societal, societal approaches. Approach. It, won't it won't be easy, easy. but it's also a huge opportunity. It's a chance to build the future we want by preventing, by preventing land, land degradation, degradation before, before it happens, it happens. And, promoting and promoting the sustainable, the sustainable use of land, land we, are we are heading in the right, in the right direction, direction towards, towards a future, future of food security, food security soils, soils that stay fertile, fertile and, and a society, society that's, that's resistant, resistant to, shocks. to shocks. And that, and is, that the is the future we need. We need. A continuación interviene. And now we'll have uh, Alain Richard on Wahi, the president of the UNCCD COP15 and a former minister of the oceans of Côte d'Ivoire. Your Excellency President Sanchez, quería hablar en español, pero mi hermano. I wanted to speak in Spanish. So I will speak in English. Your Excellency, Your Excellency Vice President Rivera, Excellencies, dear Executive Secretary, ladies and gentlemen, I am pleased to be with you today in this beautiful and uh, welcoming city of Madrid to celebrate World Desertification and Drought Day. As a former Minister of Water and Forest, the challenges of uh, desertification and drought are close to my heart. I'm aware of the responsibility that is ours in the face of climate change, but also in the face of history, in the face of those of these hundreds of millions of individuals who living, whose living conditions are deteriorating due to drought, desertification, and soil degradation. It is not by chance that in most countries, years of drought are listed as years of economic downturn. Most countries have their economies essentially dependent on the primary sector. This means they depend on a thin layer of soil and a few millimeters of rain. When the rain does not come on time and in quantity, it causes ma major disruptions. When this is coupled with uh, soil that is degraded, the crisis can turn into a disaster. This is why I'm happy that the Abidjan Legacy Program was announced by President Ouattara at the Heads of State Summit during the 15th conference of the parties to the UNCCD last May in Abidjan in order to integrate sustainable soil management and restoration into development strategies. The threat caused by droughts unites us. As today's theme reminds us, rising up from drought together is an important start. Let's, let us not forget that almost 160 million children are exposed to severe and prolonged, prolonged uh, droughts. By 2040, it is estimated that one out of four children will live in areas with extreme water scarcity. Additionally, in the European Union and the UK, annual drought losses are currently estimated around 9 billion euros and projected to reach over 65 billion euros without significant climate action. As my brother Ibrahim Chao mentioned, no country is immune to drought, rich or poor. Admittedly, the effect of drought severely hit the poorest countries, but several better-off countries 
are beginning to feel the effects of the drought, notably Australia, the United States, and Spain, which is hosting us today. To succeed, we must implement two priorities, the political dynamics linked to the leaders of the planet and the dynamics of the synergies that must exist between the public policies that each state conducts and international cooperation. Even more, to fight drought, we need to change the paradigm and opt for proactive risk-based approaches instead of reactive crisis-based approaches. To this end, I welcome the creation of the International Working Group on Drought for 2022-2024, decided at COP15 in Abidjan for a more proactive drought management. As president of COP15, I urge all parties, particularly Spain and other European Union parties, to support the work of intergovernmental working group so as to achieve concrete policy relevant results at the next conference of the parties due on uh, 2024 in Saudi Arabia. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, Madrid offers us the opportunity to amplify the new impetus that we want to give to COP15. We must make history with resolute action for the implementation of the objectives of Rio conventions. The people are watching us. The youth challenges us. History awaits us. Viva Madrid. Muchas gracias. A continuación se proyecta un video. Now we will be seeing a video by Antonio Guterres, the Secretary General of the United Nations. I congratulate the government of Spain for hosting this year's World Day to combat desertification and drought. Drought in all regions are getting more frequent and fierce. The well-being of hundreds of millions of people is being compromised by increasing sandstorms, wildfires, crop failures, displacement and conflict. By mid-century, three quarters of people could be living with drought. Climate change bears much responsibility, but so does how we manage our land. Off the world's population is already coping with the consequences of land degradation, with women and girls paying the highest price. We can and must reverse this downward spiral. Ensuring the productivity of land and soils is an inexpensive, pro-poor way to combat climate change and improve the livelihoods and well-being of the world's poorest and most vulnerable people. Empowering women and landowners is also a game changer for land restoration. We can restore land for a fraction of what is currently being spent on the env environmentally harmful subsidies. Every dollar invested in restoring land can generate 30 times that much in benefits. In Africa, the Great Green Wall of the Sahel has already restored millions of hectares of land and created thousands of jobs from Dakar to Djibouti. But much more needs to be done. Taking care of our land and its biodiversity can help address the climate crisis and assist in reaching all our sustainable development goals. Let us act now to drought-proof our future. Thank you. Vice President, Ministers, Ibrahim, Executive Secretary of the Convention Against the Certification, Ms. Combo, Mr. Alan Richard, President of COP25 and former Minister of Ministry and Waters of Cote d'Ivoire. First of all, on behalf of the Spanish Government, I would like to welcome you to this meeting in order to raise awareness and to reflect on the World Day Against Desertification and Drought, 
28 years ago, on June 17th, the, the United Nations Convention against Desertification was approved with the consensus of over 100 nations. It's an honor for Spain to have been chosen as the United Nations General Secretary to, to have been chosen to force this uh, idea, which is to rise up together against drought. We are suffering a special and unusual heat wave in Spain for this time of the year, by the middle of June, with extremely high temperatures in the Iberian Peninsula and the Balearic Islands. So we need to be alert. I would like to make use of this place to call citizens to extreme precautions, especially during the middle of the day, to avoid to be overexposed to the sun, to drink water and to take care of those most vulnerable. So let's take care of ourselves and let's take care of our environment. Let's extreme precautions against wildfires. Let's protect our environment and let's think about all those that are that have their life at risk when fighting wildfires. And now they need of our collaboration, the collaboration of all citizens and public institutions. We need to think about those that will have to do that during the summer and in let's all work together in order to prevent this heat wave and wildfires that we are suffering. Many times we talk about heat as an anecdote. We say that we didn't have any spring or we even compare the historical temperature records. But then autumn comes and we do not remember that again until the next year when we see high temperatures again sooner. We see that uh, temperatures reach 34 degrees when we are just in the middle of June. So, we are seeing temperatures that not only an anecdote, they have adverse effects on the environment of our countries, like the consequences that we will talk about today. This is why the World Day to Combat Desertification for me is an opportunity to put the focus on the way that we have to analyze these uh, symptoms uh, in the framework of the challenge that we are all living, that is the adaptation and mitigation of climate change. This is a process that is undeniable. This is a scientific evidence, and denying climate change is something irresponsible and an insult to the intelligence of our society. The fight against climate change vertebrates one of the most important transformations that we have before us as a country, which is the environmental transition that needs to be fair, inclusive, from a social and territorial perspective. There is a lot at stake in this battle. We need to face negationism and the and its consequences. Some people talk about climate religion, about climate fanatism, but there is no uh, graver uh, fanatism than those that question climate change. The only responsible way to act is to do it in a sustainable way by protecting the planet in our uh, environmental transition. There is no plan B because there is not a planet B, as young people say. Global warming increases extreme uh, meteorological events as the heat waves that we are suffering now. And I would like to give some data to assess the situation that we are living and what we are facing. The sixth report on the IP of the IPCC shows that changes due to human activity have increased in their frequency and, uh, uh, and severity. The Mediterranean region is one of the most affected ones, and we see here more clearly the human influence on the environment. An increase of 1.5 degrees in temperature would double the frequency of droughts. We, we have droughts every 10 years 
uh, and with an increase of 2 degrees, straws would be 2.4 times more frequent. And if we do not reduce the emissions of greenhouse gases, one third of the surface of Earth will be affected by moderate droughts uh, uh, before the year 2100. Several million people will suffer, as we've heard before, water scarcity at least once a month. According to the data of the World Bank, 216 million people will be forced to migrate due to this scarcity and some of the factors included like the degradation of the soil or the reduction of agricultural production or the increase of the sea level and overpopulation. An increase in of 4 degrees that would imply that 50% of all the inhabitants in the planet would be affected by droughts. In our country, unfortunately, we see these trends uh, being confirmed. The Iberian Peninsula is more and more dry. The level of our basins is lower because of an unsustainable use of water. 22 million people, that's almost half of our population, live in places where water consumption is over the available amount. 3.3 million people have a severe water scarcity, if we do not tackle environment, our environmental transition, we will face extreme events like the ones that we've seen in recent years, and these events will be more and more intense. 27 million people will be living in regions with water scarcity and the most serious data over 11 million people in the planet died in this last century because of droughts in our planet droughts are not only about the lack of rainfall, they have to do with the climate degradation and so degradation, they also have economic and social effects and political effects on the stability of countries. They also increase vulnerabilities before other climate disasters like floodings. Desertification is the degradation of dry land and uh, there are several causes but mainly they are due to climate change or the over-exploitation of uh, natural resources. That's why we should not ever leave these data aside. We need to act as other speakers have already said. We know that if we do not act now, we will have no room to react with uh, improvised measures. Cycles will be more repetitive and much more serious. So, our immediate future is defined by one term, adaptation. The way to do it is through planning. The, United, the European Union strategy to face climate change tackles some if, uh, issues like information, knowledge in order to provide solid uh, responses. In the new working plan for the 2022-2024 period for the implementation of the Water Framework Directive, the need of paying more attention to an efficient use of water resources is included in Spain, for instance, the climate change and energy transition law that was passed one year ago establishes that the goals of hydrological plants need to focus on ensuring the water security for people and also in, to preserve our biodiversity, which is rich in our country, and also to ensure the stability of economic activities. The second climate change adaptation plan until 2030 has a goal, which is to construct a country that is less vulnerable and more safe before the risks and impacts of climate change. We need to become a country that can 
resolve and respond to this need of adapting to climate change. In this week, we are combining or preparing our water planning adaptation plan and also the special plans for droughts, which are based on a system of indicators that objectively identify different situations to know when and how to act. There's also a new strategy to fight desertification, which identifies the, in, the increase of in, in the frequency of droughts as a risk, uh, a risk to human welfare and desertification, and also focusing on a sustainable use of resources and the restoration of degraded soil. The idea is to minimize the impacts of desertification and droughts in our country. That is why I would like to tell you about an initiative which is called Restoring Landscapes and Water to Adapt and resilience and with this initiative we are going to reinforce the links that we have with the African continent to fight together against desertification in the African continent which unfortunately is one of the most affected. In this fight, in this work that we have to do together with determination, we need to do it under the leadership of multilateralism and the United Nations, joining efforts, aligning strategies, executing actions together. In this sense, I would like that we all join this initiative with the goal of strengthening ourselves much more before this challenge, which is the combat against desertification and droughts. Sincerely, Ladies and gentlemen, there are fewer things that are more urgent and important than making our planet an inhabitable place for present and future generations. We know that forests and vegetation are especially important in uh, this context of climate change because they capture and store carbon and they also promote the conservation of our biodiversity. Forests grow in places where there's a, an enabling environment, but they also create these uh, environments. Water cycles are key to that. The relation between water, forest, soil, and atmosphere, that is, the role of vegetation in water cycles, shows us uh, that there are interesting possibilities to restore the green coverage in order to increase the resilience of areas that have a high risk of the this landscape restoration initiative is framed in the decade of restoration promoted by the Secretary General of the United Nations, the aim of which is to increase the, neutral, the carbon neutrality of soil, which is one of the sustainable development goals. What are we going to do through this? We are going to prioritize the restoration of the water cycle while we also focus on the capture carbon capture and storage, and also food security. We want to connect knowledge and praxis at different scales with different actors that voluntarily um, share practical examples. Also, our failures are important in order to see where we fail and how we can improve. And of course, these uh, initiatives should should be replicated all over the planet through science and through the promotion of dialogue, providing access to information and knowledge sharing, and by developing projects like this, I think that we can lead together with other countries this initiative. Many other regions could also benefit from this scientific knowledge that we collect and share. I would like to conclude by sharing a reflection about the future. I received a letter at the Moclo Palace recently 
with a question, what would you feel if you were children like us and you had all your life before you in a planet like this? This was a letter signed by the students of a primary school in Andalusia. This question is quite relevant. It's a direct question that I've had uh, in the back of my mind since then. As uh, public representatives and politicians, for us this is key. We are talking about the future of these generations. These generations will see that their future will be conditioned uh, depending on the effects and impacts of climate change. Our reflection about the way that we use the soil has an effect on these extreme events that we are seeing, like heat waves or droughts, like the heat wave that we are living in the Iberian Peninsula right now. So it's up to us uh, that this planet is inhabitable in the future. So let's uh, rise up together against droughts, let's fight climate change, because without doubt it's our biggest challenge. As Mr. Gutierrez said, this is more urgent than ever. Thank you very much and congratulations for this meeting here in Madrid. Con la intervención del señor presidente del. After the, the speech of the president of the government, we have concluded this part of the session, and in a few minutes we'll start with the next meetings. Please be seated and wait for the next session. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen.
Señoras y señores. Ladies and gentlemen, we're about to start the next session, so please be seated. Tengan la bondad de incorporarse a sus asientos. Please do be seated. We're about to start the next part of the session. A continuación y para comenzar esta jornada. So now, in order to start with the next part of the session, we will watch a video that will explain the main issues arising from the certification and draft. Thank you very much and please do pay attention. Yes, yes. Affecting people. I've seen, I've seen it with my eyes. I have, I have witnessed. witnessed. The two weeks I stayed stay there in Trukana, it really opened my heart. I interacted with women and innocent children while we were doing the emergency food reliefs. And from watching innocent kids really suffer, mothers they had lost hope and they were just staring at the dead because the place was totally different from what I envisioned. There were no trees, no shrubs, no water. I'm an agricultural meteorologist by training. And one of the stories I can share with you is being a graduate student in the state of Iowa in the United States. And this is during the uh, really bad drought in 1998. Uh, as a graduate student, of course, you have to do a lot of things, which were very interesting. But one thing I had to do was make uh, gravimetric soil samples, which means you had to take a sort of a, a turnkey screw and do about 10 different levels, about six feet down or about you know, maybe a meter. And it was a drought, I think this was in the spring, and at basically foot three, just a little over halfway, I had to start, you know, using a sledgehammer to get any kind of, you know, movement of the probe into the soil. So that's one of my, you know, first-hand experiences of, of drought uh, and, and heat waves, um, and that was pretty bad. And of course, that, that was a pretty big impact on, on the U.S. agricultural production that year. In Chad. The desert is advancing four kilometers every year. That means by just a few decades, my capital in will be under the desert. Nosotros eh, tenemos graves consecuencias en la región. Eh, los cambios que están afectando el cambio climático, los cambios que estamos viviendo los pueblos indígenas, los cambios que vemos en los territorios por el tema de la sequía, por los cambios de las temperaturas altas, realmente está afectando al tema del bosque, a nuestra alimentación y a, y a nuestra vivencia. No solo en la región amazónica, sino en la región andina, que los conecta, los ríos, la, las fuentes de agua, y también para el tema de, la, de los cultivos, para el tema de, de la alimentación. Related to um, uh, South Africa, we are one of the 30 driest countries, receiving just over 850 millimeters of rainfall per annum. Cape Town, South Africa could become the world's first major city to run out of water. No city in the world has had to deal with such a situation. La desertificación la tenemos instaurada en nuestro territorio. La orografía en la que nos situamos, la olla de Baza, la olla de Guadí, rodeado de altas montañas como puede ser Sierra Nevada con más de 3.000 metros o la Sierra de Baza por encima de los 2.000, hacen que las borrascas cuando vayan a llegar a nuestra comarca se desplacen. De aquí tenemos el desierto a muy pocos kilómetros, el desierto de los Colorados. Tenemos una zona donde las, precipita las precipitaciones son muy bajas. We receive a very small amount of rainfall in our area. Therefore, our ancestors designed a sustainable way of living to cope with the drought. Unfortunately, desired-based consumption is altering it. Resulting to it, land degradation has arisen. Hemos transformado un campo estepario de superficie de cereal principalmente a un campo principalmente ahora de almendros. 
Eso, sin duda, pues nos hace que nuestro terreno esté eh, sufriendo unas modificaciones. Si no sabemos adaptar ese cambio de cultivo a la degradación y podemos parar esa degradación, bueno, pues podremos tener un, un grave problema en años futuros. We have in the end realized that drought is not going anywhere. And one thing that I would also tend to say is drought is expensive. It makes economic sense to to invest in drought measures in non-drought times and we can really minimize its impact. And now we leave the floor to uh, Teresa Rivera, third vice president of the government and minister for the ecological transition and the demographic challenge in Spain. Good morning to everyone and please feel welcome to Madrid. Viva Madrid and viva so many other places in the world, dear Ibrahim, Executive Secretary of the UN Convention to Combat Desertification, dear participants and dear all of you that are watching these speeches from your home be a streaming, worried about the different issues that are affecting the degradation of our land and the certification, but you are all highly motivated by our slogan this year because even when things get tricky and are complicated, all together we can do so much more and so much better in line with a agenda filled with uh, stimulating proposals that have been approved in Abidjan in the COP15 less than a month ago. You are all here, connected, following the session. We have been very lucky to be invited to host this um, World Day, to raise our voices, filled with our commitment, saying together with the United Nations that it is time to act. It's time to understand that this worry about the degradation of the land and the rivers, the risk of the certification, the concerns due to drought and the need to be ready to face these challenges, offering responses to reduce the vulnerability, are the ones that should have the public space they deserve in terms of knowledge, of the dissemination of such knowledge, to be prepared, to be ready with a clear public and private commitment. It's not easy to face a challenge as difficult as this one if we do not understand and know precisely what is going on in order to be prepared if we don't have a general uh, agreement and commitment by the whole of the society to work in this area. This is not just a local issue. This is something that affects us all. This is something where the coordination of local, regional, uh, national and global action is key. This is a problem where we have learned a lot. We are so much more able to intervene, to find solutions compared to other of the main issues that we face today. And this it might be the main message of hope. Patricia was talking about the restoration of the land, of the ecosystem. And that's the message that mm, the United Nations wants to highlight this year. That's why for us, as I said, it's a great honor to be hosting this World Day. For that reason, I want to thank the Executive Secretary, Ibrahim Thio, for trusting us to continue with the work that has been done in Abidjan by our colleagues and a work that will be continue action after action, year after year, until the moment we reach the 2024 uh, COP in following this role and all these different targets that we have. In this second session of this morning, and throughout the morning in Madrid, we will know more a little bit about the proposals, the experiences, the concerns of different stakeholders. We know that more than 70 countries in the world are now 
leaving the effects of the frequency of the droughts. But not all the countries are suffering drought in the same way and not all the countries have the same capacity to react. In many places in the world, uh, long-term drought can become an issue for, for human life. It can lead to poverty, to famine. It can need years of investment and hard work in order to create progress and development. And it's also true that research and knowledge the different models on climate change, as well as understanding the different dynamics that explain us how, by changing the use of the land, offer us all the information that we need in order to create the alert system that should help us. The data that we already have and that has already been mentioned in the first speeches this morning explain the number of people that will be affected by severe drought the amount of people that will suffer the effects of the degradation of the land. These are reasons enough to start working even harder on this topic. The assessment of the impact of these areas like the Mediterranean, which are in the middle of a climatic transition, are something to be worried. It's also true that the countries as ours that are becoming more used to living with the draft are a little bit more used to this and therefore better prepared to offer solutions to mitigate the impact and to do so in a more preventive way. We cannot ignore what we have learned so far. We have to put them in practice because all these different barriers and hurdles that we find when we want to change the use of the lands and we add to this mix the climate change as well as other alarms that have to do with water stress and scarcity. These all explain how fundamental it is to work regarding the issue of droughts. Maybe the public opinion hasn't understand the full dimensions of these issues. Not in all the countries, but some countries do understand very well, as Patricia mentioned, what a draft really means. Not all the countries have that information because there are some immediate impact, but also long-term effects that, that get accrued and increase the cost and the difficulty if we want to restore the quality of our soils. That's why if we want to do something, we need to start now. Climate change and the social economic development require us to work all together, integrating climatic risk and the degradation of land in the different laws that we have for land use to guarantee that the use of natural resources is sustainable, but also to work together with our communities, with our societies, to be ready, to prepare them for resiliency, to be able to react all of us, the whole of the citizens of a country. In Spain, water and draft ratio is a classic issue. As any other country in the Mediterranean basin, we have specific complicated periods in which we have to think about what to do with ir climatic irregularity. And in fact, our water planning doesn't use only the average scenarios. We're also using stream cases in order to know the amount of water we have, what can we do, how can we react when there's a flood or when there are uh, extreme severe drought. We're working with these scenarios because we need resources and policies that might be extraordinary, but also we need to be ready before anything happens in order to know what we have and what else can we do. How can we be smarter, more efficient, in using our resources, how can, by doing this in a proactive manner, be able to respond even before the crisis and to work all together at a regional scale and level as well. As the President of the, the Government mentioned, we also have better policies regarding the land use and the use and management of water at an European level. We have been working with other main capitals from the social economic perspective as well, because economy and water and the quality of land 
have a lot to do with energy and they are key as well when we want to understand the demand, the difficulties of other classic industries that are fundamental for any economy like es ours. Capital. For us, y tourism no. is one of Son the key engines of our economy, but they are also very important for the basic foundation of food security, agricultural production, the capacity to preserve the quality of our land, to keep our forests Por eso, alive. Quizá tengamos and for that reason, we need to start to work with ideas and concepts such as a los que different to the ones that we had before, such as la capacidad de alerta restrengthening the early alerts to have management plans, plans but also special plans for crops con to have que nos indicators that will allow us to work before a crisis happens by creating awareness campaigns for the general Sabiendo population and understanding that we can all work in these scenarios that are average, but also previous to crisis and scenarios Los where the crisis has already happened. All of these soft plans have helped us to understand this, and we do it better. Now we know when and how to act. We now understand how to decide even before the crisis happens who should do what, and this has helped us to raise también la gestión del riesgo y la escasez debe formar parte de la previsión de la disponibilidad de agua en nuestro territorio. Los planes hidrológicos tienen que revertir una tendencia creciente en el uso del agua, utilizando las asignaciones establecidas pensando en el uso más inteligente de nuestros recursos. In order to do a much more smart management of natural resources in terms of availability, but also transportation and final use, if we have water scarcity due to a drought, we need to understand that this is so much more than just the amount of rainfall that we get. We need to use all of our capacities to solve this issue. Que integre adecuadamente agua, también land, buenos usos, will buenas prácticas water, agrícolas que nos permita atenuar las crecidas que nos permita recargar los acuíferos es fundamental para ir generando ese tipo de mayor basins. resiliencia This will help para poder in the alcanzar la seguridad alimentaria y para poder ralentizar food los efectos más permisivos del cambio climático trabajando con esa fina capa de la superficie que nos ayuda a disminuir la naturaleza and by inspiring ourselves in what nature does to re-strengthen our resiliency, the resiliency of our land and our different biodiversity and natural habitats. The main reasons of the certification in Spain have to do with the lack of sustainability in agricultural exploitation, the overuse of land. Many of these are ecological problems, but also financial problems. We have not taking care of our forests, we know that there's less people living in the rural areas and people are fundamental for the protection of these rural areas. And if we add the climate change and its effects on all of these, the fact that we have more climatic extreme events, we have more heat waves, more floods, more droughts, we've seen it and we are feeling it this week. We have a Madrid under extreme hot temperatures in a period of time when we don't usually get these kind of temperatures, and we know what it means for the health of the population, the well-being of this population and their everyday life. This is also an impact, as Patricia mentioned, on everything that we do. We therefore understand how fundamental it is to reduce the causes that are giving us these damaging effects that are making us understand that we need to coexist with whatever lingers in the planet after all these extreme events. That's why the plan to combat the certification will be a landmark in terms of what we're going to be doing towards the future in Spain so that future generations will be able to coexist and improve the situation, to restore what for decades, even centuries, have been probably with goodwill at the time has been causing these huge issues by over-exploiting the different resources that we have today, the resources that this future generation should have.
La estrategia de lucha contra la desertificación en la que trabajamos quiere establecer las bases para la consecución de los objetivos de la agenda de neutralidad y la degradación de la tierra y reducir la emisión de nuestro tierra. Todo en el marco de la sostenibilidad de los sectores relacionados This will include the different industries that have to do with this fundamental task of protecting the quality of our land, working towards the implementation of the European laws and directives to improve the innovation as well as the awareness in our general population, we also want to become an element that will help us to connect with our neighboring countries. The president mentioned that to work at a regional level is fundamental. But as I said at the beginning of my speech, this is not just a local action. Forget about that. Our general well-being depends upon the well-being of our neighbors. We need to understand that different actions need all this knowledge. We have that knowledge. We have that information, we have the resources, and it's fundamental to have them. As our dear Ibrahim mentioned, to develop this umbrella within this context, in this fight to combat the certification, will allow us to have a better governance. But not just that, even if we don't have the accuracy to be able to perform the task, we already know today what we have to do. And for that reason, we need to work with the neighboring countries. And in the case of Spain, we need to work with our neighbors in Africa, in the Sahel, in the Mediterranean Basin, to work together with our European neighbors. Because in many cases, this worry, this uh, concern about the de land degradation and the risk of the certification seems to be still far away challenge, but it's here and it's more imminent than what they might see or think. In Spain this year, we want to make sure that fighting water scarcity and land degradation should be the reason to help us to move towards the best scenario possible. Thank you for being here this morning. Thank you to all the participants in the different roundtables that we will have now. Thank you, dear President of the COP15 and dear Ibrahim, dear Elena, for what you've been doing in the FAO and all of you that are here today, dear friends, we need a better, safer country, more humane country that falls within the limits put by science. Thank you very much. Now, after the speech by the Vice President, we will prepare the floor for the first round table, our first working group, that will be talking about the topic how to face the draft, implementing and making real the commitments. We will have as a moderator Maria Jesus Rodriguez de Sancho, General Director of Biodiversity, Forestry and the Certification in Spain. I'm going to ask the different speakers to come to the floor as soon as the chairs are ready for them. In primer lugar, first of all, Ms. Pilar Paneque will come to the stage. She's the leader of the Spanish Citizens Observatory on Drought. She has a chair on Human Geography at the Pablo de Olavide University in Seville. We will also have Rafia Tia, Land Resources Director at the Ministry of Agriculture, Water Resources and Fisheries in Tunisia. We also have Elena Lopez Gun, CEO of iCatalyst, um, member of the second group of the IPCC on uh, climate change. And uh, finally, we also have 
Teresa Langle de Paz, director of the Women for Africa Foundation and co-founder and co-director of the UNESCO Chair on Gender Well-Being and Peace Culture at the Wisconsin-Madison University. When uh, the technical arrangements are done, they will come to the stage. Doña María Jesús Rodríguez de Sancho. Ms. Maria Jesus Rodriguez de Sancho, General Director for Biodiversity, Forestry and the Certification, will speak first. Good morning. Thank you very much for coming to this celebration of the World Day to combat the certification and droughts. We are we have the honor the honor of hosting it here in Madrid at the Reina Sofia Museum. Thanks to the Executive Secretary of the Convention for trusting in us uh, to celebrate this day together here. For me, it's also an honor to be part of this round table where we are all women, and specifically four women coming from the world of science, from the academia, they are generators of knowledge, and through their work, they are going to help us to make better decisions. Under today's motto at the World Day to Combat Desertification and Droughts, uh, uh, rising up uh, from drought together, the idea is to share together all of us and the, um, for those who are following us in the social media, we want to share um, our hope. There is reason for hope, especially thanks to this knowledge, this data that we need, and also given the way that we manage our natural resources that can help us overcome the impacts of degradation and desertification that we find all over the world, more specifically, more specifically in some places, but uh, no one is uh, free from this risk. I'm going to introduce the four speakers. As I said, they come from the world of science and the academia. First of all, to my left, I have Pilar Palenque. Pilar Paneque is in charge of the Citizens Observatory on Droughts. She has a chair at the Pablo de Olavide University in Seville. Besides, she's been at the head of several research projects and she's directed several PhD theses. Her research focuses on the social component of hydrological risk and the development of methodologies to assess the vulnerability to before droughts and especially public participation since all all of us as citizens have or can do something 
In terms of the certification, she's also worked on water governance, which is one of the items where the United Nations uh, Convention to Combat the Certification puts the focus on. This has been done through her research work and um, by directing several PhD theses. Then we have Rafia Tia. I would like to thank her for her participation in this round table. She came from Tunisia in order to share with us the experiences that she's had as a director of the Land Resources Agency at the Ministry of Agriculture, Water Resources and Fisheries in Tunisia. With her work, they are trying to prevent the effects of droughts and to increase the resilience of ecosystems. She is going to share with us the conditions of draft and the management systems that they are developing in Tunisia. Then we also have Elena Lopez Gunn. She works in a different field of research, but it is also closely related to the process that we are talking about today. She is the CEO of iCatalyst and member of the Group 2 of the IPCC, the, in the International Panel on Climate Change. She is a member of the European Union Advisory Body on Climate Change and also the president of a foundation on innovation. She is a collaborator of the Bass Center on Climate Change. She's been an associate professor at the Business School of the Water Observatory, the Botin Foundation, and the London School of Economics. She's going to help us to see the value of the social insurance in the case of land and water based on a project in Medina del Campo in Spain. Like uh, Life Duero and others. And uh, finally, we have Teresa Langle de Paz. She is the director of the Women for Africa Foundation and also the co founder and co director of the UNESCO Chair on Gender, Well Being and Peace Culture at the Wisconsin Madison University. And she, uh, she has a PhD on Hispanic Studies at the Brown University. She will explain how important the gender perspective is in this context. I wanted to organize this round table by posing a question to each of the speakers so that they can share the success stories with us, the success stories that we need to know and that we can transfer to similar situations afterwards and then we will have some general questions for all of them. First, Pilar, given your field of research in the field of public participation, I would like to ask you about race aware, awareness raising among the general population, which is important to increase resilience. How do you think that citizen science can contribute in this field? What is your experience at the um, the Spanish Observatory on Trot. Thank you for the kind invitation to participate in this meeting, which uh, luckily ha has been hosted in Spain this year. It's uh, a great occasion to put the focus on something as important uh, to our society as this, but it's also challenging from a scientific perspective because it's still something, it's a risk that it's it's not really well known. We've made a lot of progress in the study and monitoring of droughts. We've developed tools that help us do an exhaustive real-time follow-up with a high level of precision. In Spain, we have good examples of this, but we haven't had a similar level of investment in order to integrate this social component in the water planning, that is vulnerability. And this leads us to social and institutional dimensions and realities that change all the time, which are more difficult to measure and to translate into 
indicators that can be followed up afterwards. This is related to your question, the perception that we have of these risks defines our vulnerability to a large extent because depending on this perception we will more or less prone to suffering damages in the event of droughts and we will be more or less able to adapt in the long and short term as you know risks are selected and defined socially, that is, the way in which we perceive and interpret individually or collectively an event like a period of draft will uh, also have an impact on the way that we manage it. That's why we need to make an important effort in terms of the information that we provide to our citizens on droughts and water scarcity in order to correctly identify the threats that we are facing and in order to decide the level of risk that we consider as acceptable and that we are ready to accept. In order to move forward in this uh, direction, citizen science offers us many methodologies and tools that can help involve citizens directly in our research and the development of our projects in order to improve aspects that affect us all in our daily life. This way of doing science tries to generate new knowledge that we could not uh, acquire by traditional means and it has a scientific and political uh, validity. It can be applied to the management of water, land and associated risk. How can citizen science contribute to a better knowledge and prevention of the risk of drought? There are three main aspects here. First, we need to know what is the level of information that citizens have on aspects like climate change, water use, or the causes of scarcity. We can only do that by asking directly our citizens Citizens. This will be also really important to define the uh, risk information uh, campaigns, uh, which is key in order to prevent droughts. Since we are talking about a uh, risk that is defined by uncertainty and which is related to a resource, that is water, where there are many interests at stake, citizen science facilitates the integration of different kinds of knowledge, expert knowledge and non-expert knowledge, and also it allows, to, it allows us to look for local solutions in the case of droughts. Also, citizen science contributes to increase the scientific culture of our population. It constructs social value and more resilient societies, and all, it also helps citizens to self-organize and to create initiatives to solve problems that they are facing, or to be more prepared to choose the topics that they want to include in the scientific and political agenda. In this sense, our experience at the Citizens Observatory on Droughts has been quite positive. After many years of work and reflection about water management and droughts, we've been able to create a meeting point for different scientific uh, 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 fields like geography or the humanities or IT in order to move forward in this uh, social component of risk in its complexity. We've developed a methodology to identify a vulnerability index, which includes items like the uh, adaptation capability, which uh, they are considered as essential in the international debate in terms of participation processes, uh, trust in institutions, or risk perception. But it hasn't 
haven't been explored enough so far. In these projects, citizens have contributed to calculating these indicators and also to assess several management measures. We will focus more on them by the creation of citizens' juries. We've seen that our population prefers to use measures like saving or reutilization, and there is also a lack of support for water reservoirs, for instance. We've created a chat box also for non-expert citizens designed for people that do not work in this field. The objective is to facilitate uh, the understanding on, of hydrological and climate information as well as planning and also communication actions in order to increase the no level of knowledge of population on these issues. We have seen that it's weak despite the high level of data because there's been little awareness raising. As some uh, other barometers have shown, we've seen that the majority of the population do not know how the, the water is distributed among different users. Uh, irrigation can, uh, consumes most of, uh, of, of, of our water and population try to save water at home, but we know that it's this will hardly have an effect on water scarcity. So at the observatory we try to offer information to enable a dialogue between politicians, uh, scientists and our society in order to leave this catastrophic uh, view on droughts and water scarcity aside and in order to see it as a way to carry out important transformation and as also as a driver of the environmental transition. Well, it's been quite interesting what you, what you told us. Through your work, we can see what is the awareness level of citizens and it can also help us work all together in the same direction. So, the importance of, of the perception of irrigation and water consumption has been quite interesting because sometimes we see things uh, um, quite differently from the reality. Now we are going to give the floor to Rafia. As I said, she's the director of the agency in charge of land resources. I think Rafia is probably going to feel more comfortable speaking in English. I will make uh, the question in English. Could you mention the main challenges related to draft management and governance that you face in Tunisia and explain the strategies and actions that you have carried out over the years to mitigate draft efforts and adapt to them? Thank you. Uh, good morning. Uh, I'm Matia Rafla. Thank you for the invitation. I am pleased to be with you and uh, celebrate the World Desification Day uh, and Drought Day. Uh, uh, I am uh, from the uh, Ministry of Agriculture of Tunisia and uh, I am pleased also to uh, contribute uh, with you and uh, in uh, this opportunity how to tackle, anticipate the effect of drought and strengthen the, the resilience of ecosystem and to share with you drought condition and management system strategies in Tunisia. Tunisia is one of uh, countries that adopted during the United Nations summit held in New York 2050, the agenda which se sets the 70 Sustainable Development Goal SDG. So drought is explicitly taken into account in Goal 50, preserve and restore terrestrial ecosystem, ensuring uh, that they are used sustainably, sustainably manage forest, combat desertification, halt and reverse the process of land degradation and end 
the loss of biodiversity. More specifically, it is targeted in uh, goal uh, 50.3, which states that by 2030, combat desertification, restore degraded land and soil, including land affected by desertification, drought and floods, and thrive to achieve land degrad uh, degradation neutral world. So Tunisia has just finalized the national drought plan and aligned itself in international best practices. Its objective is to anticipate the effect of drought and to strengthen the resilience of ecosystem and communities taking in account the gender issue. So the national drought plan aims is to using adequate tools for declaring and announcing drought. Second, identification the impact and issue caused by drought during uh, using indicators. Det determination of the causes of vulnerability taking in account the gender aspect. To define the appropriate risk mitigation and adaptation measure. Specification of the institutional, technical, and financial mechanism for the implementation of the drought plan, national drought plan. So over the next decades, the big challenge will be, especially with limited water and land resources, to increase production while losing less water. The new national policy and strategy were developed to support the future implementation of national drought plan. They are articulated on sustainable management of natural resources for the development of rural territories, adaptation of soil to climate change, and the strengthening of good territorial governance mitigation. So sustainable land management good practices should be considered as the main approach to to face the drought, increasing the storage of water in soil, green water and groundwater, and protect the fertile land on the hillside against drought. So promoting go governance of water resources management uh, in uh, water sector strategy in Tunisia includes saving water and rationalization, the operation and improving the efficiency of hydrolink installation. So Tunisia was involved in many project programs with main objective is to take in uh, adequate measure to achieve land degradation neutrality at the horizon 2030. This activity was held in collaboration and partnership with many partners like FAO, GIZ, WOCAT, IFD, ICARDA, ERD, financed by GEF, UNCCD, BAT and World uh, bank. So standardized methodology and developed tools, specific data were developed, land degradation assessment approach in the framework of LADA project, land use system, land degradation map were, were achieved. National SLM practices database built with the support of FOCAT and FAO. During 2020-2022, uh, uh, we, uh, we held actually technical cooperation project uh, which is entitled Capacity Development for the Sustainable Management of Soil Resources in the NINA region to achieve the sustainable, uh, sustainable development goals. The project involves uh, to, uh, 12 NINA countries with the main objective improving the understanding of soil characteristics and the importance of the integration into land use planning decision implementation of management practices. Second objective, strengthening national capacity for the implementation of normative tools on sustainable soil management. Strengthening national and international collaboration on sustainable soil management. So two parts in this project, capacity building for uh, technical, uh, in technical uh, analysis of soil, plant and water, and uh, implementation of standard operating procedure, the SOAPs, with the support of FAO, 
for the chemical and physical soil parameter analysis, uh, focusing also on quality management and quality control for soil analysis and interpre interpretation of the soil result. Grid effort, war efforts were also invested to collect data and soil profile data for mapping, so 4,000 georeferenced soil sample analysis value are available now for mapping and setting up national organic map and the soil sequestration national uh, carbon map and salinity map. Action plan should be provided soon also. So in, uh, during 2021-2022, uh, Tunisia is also a representative stakeholder and key actor in loop for LDN process. Loop for LDN is land use planning for land degradation neutrality, technology innovation for the design of a land use planning solution of degradation of land degradation neutrality at subnational level. So the tool, the tool, this tool, sorry, is greatly helps as to understand where to focus plan restoration activity and design for reducing land degradation. Case study were conducted in Tunisia. The first step is of an going process was that uploading data set, uploading risk map, land use map, suitability map, and this allowed to define area of interest, planning on changing land use, what land use type change is proposed. Transition, transition scenario and series of indicator was generated, especially competition between crop and olive trees plantation. Uh, also, Tunisia also was involved in a DSSLM project during 2000. 60 and 2020, Jeff funded FAO project on decision support, mainstreaming and scaling up for sustainable land management, uh, which, is, uh, which was implemented in 50 uh, countries. So uh, this project uh, allowed us to, to make a decision support framework and uh, which provides guidance to country land degradation and sustainable land management assessment and management tools at different levels to scaling up and scaling out uh, sustainable land management and uh, implementation. Action plan was uh, also um, uh, prepared and developed. So many uh, maps were uh, developed at a different scale showing land use system, uh, form of degradation, repetition, spatial repetition, and which kind of SLM, sustainable land management, uh, are proposed uh, leading uh, decision maker and how to, to proceed at national and local level. Also, database were uh, uh, developed and implemented by WOCAT approach. So at the end, uh, as uh, participating in uh, the COP50, uh, I see that you, uh, UNCCD, the JF National Mechanism, GCF, are uh, giving, uh, uh, are uh, uh, making um, uh, many funds to encourage country to develop a program, a project, uh, to achieve land degradation neutrality and to mitigate and uh, to be adapted to climate change. So uh, it is opportunity to, to develop uh, uh, programs and projects. The main uh, challenge is how to valorize and to make database and how to harmonize data on soil and natural resource and uh, water and to valorize all, uh, to organize all this data to, to make maps that leads uh, and uh, geo tools uh, that leads decision maker where to intervene, where to uh, to implement sustainable land management to rehabilitate soil and improve uh, production, uh, socioeconomic condition, uh, livelihood condition, and also biodiversity with uh, integrated aspect. Uh, also, uh, one. Uh, 
aspects should be uh, supported, wider application and scaling up of var uh, various SLM, and also uh, many efforts for, for improving the institutional action framework, synergy and harmony of different uh, strategy and mechanism, how people can work together to face uh, degradation, drought, and how to develop harmonized and uh, programs. Thank you for attention. Thank you, Rafia. Thank you very much for sharing with all of us several initiatives and projects that have been implemented in Tunisia, especially the National Plan Against uh, Draft that has created so many concerns. We share so many concerns with your country in this respect. And also for all that information about the projects for land degradation neutrality for the 2030 horizon and uh, everything that you have explained to us about the different tools that you've been using uh, to fight against climate change and to implement this land degradation neutrality. Now, uh, in the same topic, I'm going to leave the floor now to Elena. As I mentioned before, she works in this specific area and again, this explains the relevant uh, connection between the three main agreements of the Rio 1992 Convention. This conference was talking about biodiversity, the certification and climate change. All of these are topics that are interrelated and there's an influence of one upon the other. So, whenever you're ready, Elena. I have to make the question. Sorry about that. I forgot. The question for Elena was is the increase of the severity and the frequency of drought will affect the amount of water and will create water scarcity. Based on your own experience, what are the main challenges when we want to mitigate this risk of drought and what are the tools and the approaches that we have already in order to face the risks that come together with drought based on the use of the land that we're doing? Well, first of all, thank you for inviting me. Maybe the most useful would be to talk about specific examples, and I'm going to give examples based on science, because science can lead to action. So I'm going to tell you a case, which is in my opinion a good example, because this way you will be able to see the whole process that you have to go through to make things feasible. Because that's how you get to where Pilar is, when you start to uh, achieve the involvement of the users. Because I'm working in climate change, you need to understand that in order to adapt ourselves, and we have to adapt ourselves to the situation, is in itself an opportunity of change for our systems, because our systems clearly are letting us know that they are at a critical stage. I'm going to talk about an aquifer uh, we're on a half away from Madrid, in the north area of Madrid. It's one of the biggest in Europe, and this is an aquifer that is in a terrible state in every single sense. There are many aquifers in the same situation right now around the world. This story it just started uh, with an idea, as usually things do. Our idea was considering the possibility of an adequate management of natural resources. How can that become a natural guarantee against extreme events? And also, especially in a stage of high uncertainty as the stage in which we are right now. Another key idea in this example was to prevent future damage by investing time and money now to make sure that those damages didn't happen, or if they do happen, they will be less relevant in the future. 
justamente se centraba en el binomio so entre agua we were trying to work in this area eh, we had this both, uh, both these two elements de, we de had the land and the water we were trying to improve the management or the land management when you work on that obviously you're also talking about the mitigation of the risk for the water system. So, uh, this is the story of Medina del Campo, and I'm going to tell you the whole story. We all started by defining the, use, the, the issue with the users. Those that live in that area are the ones living the consequences of the inadequate management of the systems, the systems that are failing. Last week, we got together with them again, and uh, most of their concerns were the fact that they were very worried about drought and water scarcity, but they also talk about the social aspect of this problem. And this is giving us a bit of a clue about the fact that when you get there and you talk with people, people think of the issue, take into consideration every single aspect. So what we did was to define a series of measures that could become useful facing the issues that they have identified. We through an European project that just concluded, we were able to engage different stakeholders uh, from the science uh, area, we had the Geological Mining Institute, we have all the countries that also join us to participate in this, and we were able to create a simulation of the measures that we have designed. And one another fundamental message of this, together, uh, we understood that we need to work, as it was mentioned this morning, with nature, not against nature. Otherwise, we will continue damaging the different ecosystems that we have, the incredible capacity of nature to offer us things that protect us. If we don't take care of nature, nature will attack us, as we have just seen recently. So, we define the issue all together, we design the measures, and for me this was a lesson learned by the users and for us. The users tend to think of this from a systemic point of view, and uh, the results were also interesting because they don't tend to think of a lot of things. They just design a pack of measures, a set of measures, and we also learn from that because they were quite smart in that sense. They were telling us that they needed measures targeting specifically uh, land management. They were talking about preserving the land, changing agricultural and farming uh, traditions in order to keep the land healthy so that it will retain that water because that aquifer is in a difficult situation right now. Also, they were also talking about the fact that if the land is in a better condition, retaining the water, the, the land will be better, you will need less irrigation, and that will be better in terms of water stress. But they also realized in terms of demand that they needed better crops. They needed to have crops more adapted to the specific situation of this area of Spain. According to the last surveys, we've seen that this is one of the key measures to adapt the crops to the specific context of the regions. And they also wanted regu new regulations, a control on the use of water, because they considered that this was fundamental, but also take into consideration the human factor, because they were also creating and talking about creating an awareness campaign. The most relevant thing here is, thanks to the cooperation with scientists, we were able to work in this set of measures. They said that they were, they were correct in the design of these measures. We could create more jobs and even increase the benefits and the income from per hectare in that same land, which in general is telling us that the users understand pretty well what is going on in their specific context and the measures that could help. And I wanted to tell you this example for another reason. When you have all these different stakeholders participating in the design, including the administrative, the NGOs, 
lo que, lo que se consiguió es que science, estas medidas, de alguna manera, experts, dieron lugar as well a otro proyecto, este, en este caso de implementación, gracias, gracias a los fondos uh, NAIF, project, eh, es un proyecto this integrado, was a project that was donde estas medidas in, se están incorporando en el plan de implement de manera these que ya están haciendo simulaciones de cómo serían los objetivos, cómo so serían las operaciones fluviales, para de alguna manera eh, inundar, en, aquifer, en este caso está pensando más en, en el problema de inundaciones, to also in this case también, they are working eh, in the simulation, especially facing the issues or potential issues of floods, este caso, floods. Eh, and also we also have another uh, European project that comes from the Innovation Agency, which has a lot to do with uh, environmental intelligence, and this has to do with the use of technology as a means to an end, not an end in itself, but a way of making better decisions, not letting the technology take the decisions for us. So we are going to add some sensors on the land, on the specific areas, using different models and using also satellite images, this has already been used uh, thanks to FAO and the convention and um, Como comentaba Pilar, ¿no? pues As Pilar mentioned, Fatia, oh, I think it was Fatia who was mentioning, uh, we will be using this, focusing on the specific que territories, getting the information for those who have to make the decisions, because we're talking about farmers, we're talking about citizens, aquí, we want eh, all the users semana, of these lands and waters to be semana, empowered by data. By the end of last week, we were in Medina del Campo, installing all of these humidity sensors, they are not very expensive and this will help these users to have the power of the data to understand what is going on with their land, how to do a different and better management of water in their specific plots of land. And uh, this, my conclusion here would be that a better land management cannot completely avoid drought because the risk, we know that, that that hazard is already there, but we can mitigate the impact of this hazard by retaining that humidity level on the land and to understand adaptation as a possibility to reset, to, to start again in that land is a great opportunity as long as you take into consideration both aspects, both land and water, and we are completely in favor of that integration instead of thinking that um, inadequate land um, management just affects the water management and that's it. We think there's a lot of room for improvement in management. Thank you, Elena. Por compartir con nosotros la interesante experiencia que pone de manifiesto la importancia. Thank you for de sharing this great uh, example by including the users from the first stage defining the, the issues and the problems. I think all the speakers have already talked about this, and I think this is one of the most relevant aspects that we can add to this roundtable. I'm talking about specifically this. I would like to ask Teresa, as Antonio Guterres mentioned in the video we saw before, that the drought tends to affect more the younger generation and the women. So based on your own experience, working in the Cómo podrías explicar in the foundation cómo las and in para luchar your previous experience and your background, what can you do to fight the certification and draft in Africa as well as in other continents? Why this should include gender in the in these policies to make sure that equity is achieved in order to um, make this also part of the whole system? Thank you very much, Maria Jesus, for your invitation to this roundtable. First of all. I would like to say that our foundation, Mujeres for Africa, that I'm representing here today, works to promote the development of African countries with an active um, participation of African women in this process to modernize their countries. We are very aware of the severe issues social economic issues that have to do with climate change, including water scarcity that affect specifically women. But also this means that we know for sure, based on our experience of 10 years now, that women are also a key part of the solution. 
For that reason, I would like to explain one central idea first. And this is that any public policy or any project or approach at the beginning, any initiative that has to do with environmental degradation, to solve this land degradation, to to rethink the consequences of this, needs to include a change in the, in the values. And by that we mean adding gender equality as a core element not only to advance in terms of social justice, we've talked about vulnerability for women and, and girls because they tend to be the weakest link in these societies and everything that happens in the society tends to affect them more and if they are in the, if the economic situation is worse, usually it affects them even more. But also in order to reduce potential uh, and worsening environmental effects in order to stop these to continue in time but also to prevent any other potential issues that might start or might have to do with these environmental issues and by that I mean conflict, social issues, sometimes violence and even war. Facing all of these, I have to say that we are working in different areas, such as culture, we're working in educational projects, we're working in projects that have to do with financial empowerment. Again, for us, gender is one of the key elements, it's multi-sectorial, it covers every single area, so we have different projects and areas in which we are working right now. But we also have a specific projects for healthcare or regarding scientific research adapted to... Well, I'll, I'll let you know a little bit more about that because we're trying to prevent or face specific issues or more severe issues that have to do with the environment. I would also like to add that I'm going to mention to... I know I don't have a lot of time, but I'll try to mention two things. On the one hand, uh, gender approach helps and is part of our strategy and the way we work in the foundation because it's helpful when you are trying to reduce and compensate the scourge that women suffer due to structural inequality that we can see everywhere in the world because of how the world is structured in general in the climate and the climate change effects are, are no stranger to this and we need to repair these damages we need to compensate these effects and these impacts and in order to try to um, solve the injustice that have uh, the women have been suffering but we also have to work in order to promote that women's leadership, their knowledge, their information can be part of every single area in which we're working and every single professional sphere. And by that, first of all, we have this clear mandate within the framework of what we're talking today, which is to strengthen women's leadership in all professional, social, economic areas. This is due to different areas, and I'm going to try to explain why. To foster and promote women's leadership. And I will explain the second mandate that we have, which is to explain the incredible amount of knowledge, the talent by given by women. Women can produce knowledge. They are essential elements. At the higher level of scientific research, scientific research that has to do with the topic that we have today at hand, but also from the top to the bottom, our colleagues have mentioned a little bit about this. These are essential elements. These women know uh, things that can be part of the essential sol solutions, and that's part of our second mandate. Going back to the first mandate to strengthen and promote this women leadership, there are several reasons why we do this, and I'm going to mention some of these reasons. If you work in Africa or in um, 
these kind of countries, you know that women are the engine if you want change. They are the ones that take in, uh, upon themselves to care for the culture of the society, of their families, to maintain peace and harmony in their communities. One of the data that we have is that in the sub-Saharian Africa, women, the percentage of women that work, that are able to make their countries advance are 90% we see it in Tanzania, in Burundi, in Rwanda. You need to work with women if you want to foster these kind of sustainable models. We've also had a project in Tanzania, which has been called Green Voices, where 85% of the women in Tanzania, in the rural areas, have been working, are working in, in farmlands, they are working in agricultural sectors. That's why we need to work with them. We need a comprehensive approach. We're also working with journalists because we need to create this awareness campaign. People need to understand all the knowledge that these women have. And we've been working with social leaders to make sure that everything that we do in one area can be also shared with the rest of the communities. I would also like to mention another important idea. This is a book that I would like you to read, which is Corinne Peluchon which is a book about how to restore animals and the world. And she talks about the capacity of humans to make an, have an impact on political decision depends on their own autonomy. So for that reason, leadership is fundamental. Women need to have this opportunity to have an influence, to have an impact on every single aspect of the development of their countries at uh, the local, regional or professional level. We need to change our values. We need to understand life in a different way and we need to understand how to work together instead of only for ourselves. And we need to listen to women for this because based on the culture that we have received because we live in a patriarchy, women know so much more. What's the balance between reason and knowledge? Because, not biologically, but we have already internalized through the different gender dynamics of the world in which we live, we're already doing that balance. We have it in ours to do that. And for that reason, I think the possibility of going back or to changing these values to face the issues that are coming due to climate change require us to pay attention to what they say. They're not just part of the knowledge that we share, and they're not only stakeholders in this change, but they're humans, individuals that almost spontaneously, because from the moment they are born, from the moment we are born, the way in which we understand the synergies, we tend to find a better balance between reason and emotions. We care, we are carers. We live towards the community, for the community. We take care of our families, of our communities. We tend to listen and to dialogue. These are the values that we need in order to end a system that is leading to a never-ending exploitation of resources, where everyone is just fighting for their own benefit and we need to do this if we want to do something in terms of climate change. And the second reason why we are fostering this, based on uh, this, ref uh, this idea of leadership, has to do with what we mentioned before, and I would like to highlight it all over again, women, through our own resiliency processes, we tend to do things by what some psychologists, like Claire Semen said, it has to do with this effective solidarity. We're not individualized. We tend to work in this direction. And it's not just me who says this. African and Western feminists are saying, like, Biomana Meka, Amina Mama, all of these are telling us that it's impossible to keep on working with a system of values that keeps on highlighting on individual interests instead of thinking, uh, for example, in Africa, in a more community-based approach. 
our second mandate. I don't want to take any more time. Is that women produce knowledge. We have several projects, programs, in fact, because we've been working in these for years in the foundation that keep on um, strengthening and believing and committing towards a stronger scientific specialization. We have she, she do research, they do research which is for a specific female scientist in the continent in all of the different areas in science. We're talking about high level scientists or researchers and uh, we have a specific research project that are having already an impact on each one of these countries. They go to these research institutions, when they go back to their countries, they implement these projects. And I will also like to connect this with my first ideas, saying that 99.9% .9 of these researchers that come to um, work in the Severo Ochoa, for example, in the Western institutes, they go back to their countries completely committed to give back to implement in their countries what they have learned and done here. Some of these women have social projects, many of them. For example, a researcher from Nigeria, Rosalani, that came here recently. She works with an NGO. She has her own NGO uh, working on environmental projects to clean waters, to treat waters. And they have created a, a network of climatic uh, ambassadors in a rural area of the south of Nigeria. This is what I wanted to tell you about. We need to listen to them. We need to work with them. They have to have a stronger role as part of the whole system, sharing information and knowledge. They work in the rural areas. They're working in the agricultural sector. Then we also have scientists as, as well to be included in this whole process. We need to understand that we have to fight against this knowledge gap of the Western world. We tend to think that women are the agents of knowledge, that the Western world is the place where all the essential knowledge comes from in order to solve the problems that we have in the world. We need to change that. We start, need to start looking towards Africa and to understand that part of that knowledge comes from women as well. And there's a fundamental information to help us solve the problems that we have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Teresa, for the ideas that you shared and these experiences. I had uh, planned a second round of interventions, but we are a bit behind schedule, so in order to give time for the next round table, I'm tr I will try to sum up uh, what we've talked about. First of all, the importance of knowledge the importance of having data, harmonized data at our disposal, as Rafia said, also how do we engage with citizens in order to define problems, how citizen science and citizen science technical can help us do that in order to anticipate these scenarios. And also in terms of citizens' involvement, what is uh, the role that women need to have at all levels, at the level of knowledge generation in the field of science and at all levels. To conclude, I would like to mention how important solidarity is. Some years ago, the State Secretary of Research started his intervention in our meeting saying that the environment is a matter of solidarity. And this is something that we've seen here in this round table. Thank you very much for your intervention. Let's uh, now give uh, the floor to the next uh, set of speakers. Thank you very much. Now we're going to show a short video on the situation of Spain and the national strategy to combat desertification. La desertificación es uno de los mayores retos a los que nos enfrentamos en el siglo XXI. 
El cambio climático, la presión sobre los recursos naturales, la sobreexplotación de las aguas o la agricultura y ganadería intensivas acentúan la degradación de las tierras en las zonas secas de todo el mundo. También en España. La disminución de la productividad del suelo y la pérdida de biodiversidad y de sumideros de carbono son algunos de los efectos de la desertificación. Pero sus impactos van más allá de la naturaleza. La desertificación tiene serias repercusiones sociales y económicas, como el abandono progresivo de las zonas rurales. La falta de una gestión sostenible de la tierra puede llevar a su vez a fenómenos que favorecen la desertificación, como los incendios forestales. En España, casi las tres cuartas partes del territorio son consideradas tierras secas. Se caracterizan por su variabilidad climática, una productividad limitada por la escasez de agua y una renovación de los recursos lenta, lo que las hace más propensas a la desertificación. Para hacer frente a esta crisis internacional, España participa activamente como parte de la Convención de Naciones Unidas de lucha contra la desertificación. En 2008, España elaboró su primer programa de acción nacional contra la desertificación. En 2022, está desarrollando una nueva estrategia nacional de lucha contra la desertificación, que establece un nuevo marco para las políticas e iniciativas que contribuyan a la lucha contra la desertificación, a alcanzar la neutralidad en la degradación de la tierra y a la restauración de las zonas degradadas. La estrategia incluye un diagnóstico sobre los principales escenarios de la desertificación en España. Cultivos afectados por la erosión, zonas de regadío afectadas, paisajes asociados a la intensificación insostenible de la ganadería, terrenos agrícolas abandonados y bosques que no son gestionados adecuadamente. También propone medidas para fortalecer las actuaciones de lucha contra la desertificación, que ya vienen aplicándose en España, fomentando la aplicación de esquemas participativos de planificación y mejorando y actualizando las herramientas para el análisis del riesgo y la toma de decisiones. La estrategia sitúa a España a la cabeza de la lucha contra la degradación de nuestra tierra. A continuación, now we will move to the next panel on drought policies and their components. The question is, what does science tells us about drought risk depending on the different climate change scenarios? This panel will be more directed by Elena Pita, director of the Biodiversity Foundation in Spain. We will have as participants Marx Boboda, director of the National Monitoring Center on Drought in the United States, and a climate, a climate scientist at the Nebraska Lincoln University, Elena Semeda, uh, deputy director of the FAO, and ex former minister of fisheries, agriculture, and rural development in Cabo Verde. And also Skumsan Nitschang, the general director of Biodiversity Planning and Management at the Forestry, Fisheries and Environment Ministry in South Africa. Elena Pita will speak first. Thank you very much. Welcome to this round table where we will have to face some additional challenges. Since our first panelist, Marx Kuboda, had some problems, he couldn't uh, fly to Madrid, unfortunately. So we have also some challenges in terms of translation, and we are also behind schedule. Fortunately, we are used to adapting, so we will try to cover all the topics that we wanted to tackle in this round table in an agile way so that we can give uh, the main ideas that we wanted to convey to our audience. This round table focuses on drought policies and their components. Since the international community is uh, making commitments 
to help countries, people, uh, people and the most vulnerable communities to face the challenges resulting from drought and in order to prevent the loss of lives uh, and livelihoods and also the damages uh, that ecosystems and properties suffer, how can we translate these international commitments into concrete actions on the field? What are the key features that policies need to have and what are the challenges and hurdles that we face? We have the honor of having Mars Svoboda, Elena Semedo and Skumsan Stanga. Mars Svoboda is the director of the National Drought Monitoring Center in the U.S., a climate scientist at the Nebraska Lincoln University. Can you hear us, Mark? Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me okay? Okay, welcome to this panel. You owe us a visit to Madrid next time. <laughs> We also have Elena Semeda, Deputy Director of the FAO and former Ministry of Fisheries, Agriculture and Rural Development in Calo Verde. She is an economist and she is specialized in development. Welcome to this panel. We also have Skumsa Nstanga, General Director of Biodiversity Planning and Management at the Forestry, Fisheries and Environment Ministry in South Africa. Welcome, Skumsa. So without further delays, since we need to be resilient and adapt to the time that we have, I would like to start this dialogue with a question for Mark. Mark, I have a question on early warning systems for you. Given that... Uh, excuse me, excuse me, the translator's coming through can, when can you're you speaking, me? so I can't hear you, Elena. Mm, I don't know. Hi, Mark, can you hear us? Hello? Or maybe, can you hear us, Mark? Apparently not. No, I, 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 I can't hear Elena. I can only hear the translator. But I, I, I'm asking you, I'm, I'm asking the question in English. Okay, okay. Is that okay? Yeah. Yes, uh, yes. yes. <laughs> Okay, yeah, I, I would like to, well, I was saying that um, early warning systems are a key pillar for darkness uh, preparedness and, and, and policies. And uh, we have also seen in last years, they have, they have experienced a, a huge technological improvement. But, and, well, they provide us with important information. But the, my question is how to turn this information into action, how to turn early warning into early actions, and qua, wha, what are the barriers that we have to overcome in order to achieve these objectives? Okay, so I, I, I heard your question, but the translation comes through to me in Spanish. So I need to <laughs> not hear this translation. Um, I can I can answer your question though. I, I, first of all, let me thank the organizers for the invitation to this very important day. It's great to see a drought on this platform. Um, and I'm sorry that I can't be there in person. I had uh, allow me to make it to Spain. Uh, so speaking of risky. Once you lose your seat on a plane, it's hard to get another one. So, <laughs> again, apologies for not being there. Uh, to answer your question, um, this is what we call the now what moment. So, uh, you know, we have this Hopefully, what do we do with that information now? How do we make it for policymakers and decisions? And for natural resource managers as well. So, to me, uh, you know, with satellites and uh, automated stations and all the networks that are in play around the world to monitor drought and, and uh, our climate, the real challenge is not necessarily a new tool set, but a change in our mindset. And, and you know, of all the hazards that impact society, Droughts, perhaps, are the most analogous to climate change. If you think about it, 
tsunamis, floods, hurricanes, typhoons, tornadoes. These impact a relatively small area with a small spatial footprint, and they typically don't last very long. Um, days, maybe some weeks, but when you start talking about drought, it can, it can impact very large areas, several million hectares, and it can last for months or even years. So it's a different mindset, not only in the tools we use, but also in how we respond and plan for drought. So there's a scale issue here. There's a usability issue here, not just developing something and hoping people will use it, but really addressing their needs um, to, to make sure that the questions they have are answered when it comes to responding to drought in a timely fashion. And ideally, being prepared even before a drought happens. Uh, unfortunately, human nature is such that uh, you don't deal with the problem until you're in the middle of it. And uh, we'd really like to change that mindset as well. The other thing I think we can do to change our mindset in drought is typically you think of it as only being a slowly evolving sort of hazard that always takes months or years to develop. And with, with climate change and global warming, what, what I believe we are already seeing in the data and in the characteristics of drought is a change associated with these increasing temperatures. And that is the droughts can, re, can actually develop very quickly. We call these flash droughts. They can uh, then manifest themselves and, and maybe they, they do become a longer term drought that eventually may affect water supply, maybe not. But this is the challenge with drought now is it is not just the typical, stereotypical, long-term uh, hazard. It can come on very quickly. And uh, maybe you've heard the saying that real estate um, is all about location, location, location. The truth is with drought, it's really about timing, timing, timing. And so if these droughts hit at the wrong time, at a critical point in particular phenological cycle of various crops, grasslands, pasture, etc., uh, then it can have a real impact very quickly. And we're seeing this with increasing, increasing temperatures. And so uh, this leads me to my, my uh, other point, and, and maybe this will come up a little bit later in the discussion, and that's in regards to impact collection. This is a huge gap uh, globally. Um, we're starting efforts to do this. We've been trying to do this with partners around the world, with my center and, and partners uh, in Europe and Africa, South America, to treat impact collection the same way we treat uh, collecting precipitation and temperature and stream flow and reservoir levels and groundwater. We need that to develop that baseline. It's really about uh, identifying risk and vulnerability. And so this so this is, where, is where, what now, what now, what, now, what do we what do, do now, now with this information, information from a drought early warning, warning system? And the key, the key word missing there, there to me in, in, in the drought, drought early warning information, information system, 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 which you see often referred to as DEWS or D-E-W-S, is, is the word I, I so do us, us. And that would that be would for information. information. And again, and again that's, that's the distilling and packaging of data, of information, that makes, that makes this, this usable by, by decision, decision makers and policy makers. This, this is a critical step and it really leads to, uh, while, while I'm, I'm focusing mostly in my answer on what we call the three pillars, pillars. the first pillar first being drought early warning, warning uh, which, which I should also say in context, context is both, um, a, lot a lot of people, people think, think that's, that's just forecasting. Well, drought, well, is, drought very is very difficult to forecast. forecast. Um, and um, even, even if, if I could I tell, tell you with 100% certainty, certainty that there will be drought across uh, any, given any given region, region this summer, summer. I need I diligent day-to-day -day monitoring to accompany to that forecast. forecast. So really, so they, really need they need to work, work hand, hand in glove, glove where, where we have both diligent monitoring and we have forecasting. As the skill gets better, we still need that to tie into that information delivery to decision makers so they can do something with that data. So that leads, so that leads me to my, my last, last point, point, and that is uh, uh, the three pillars that I mentioned just a, a little bit ago. We're focusing, at least in my answer, on the first pillar, drought early warning, but there are two other pillars, and that's the now what. Um, impacts, as I mentioned, was a lead in to risk and vulnerability assessment. That would be the second pillar. And the third pillar would be policy, uh, mitigation policy and planning. 
And in this context, in the drought realm, by mitigation, where you might be used to hearing that in the climate change world as greenhouse gas reduction, in drought, mitigation is any action we can take in advance of, preferably in advance of, or during the onset of drought to reduce societal impact uh, from that drought. So there are actions we can take, hopefully, to reduce that impact. And, and, and the third pillar is key there, because not only do we need to know where society is at risk and vulnerable uh, in pillar two, but then we need to tie it into a plan. So if you have a great drought early warning system, but don't have a drought plan or a water plan that addresses drought, how do you trigger action on the plan? And conversely, if you have a great plan, but not a good drought early warning system, you're not going to have the data that are critical to show you those thresholds that are going to trigger action in the plan. So they need to work hand in glove. And so we need all three pillars working together, I think, to do a better job of proactively managing droughts now and in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. Apparently, the challenge was not the translation, but the sound part. Finally, we were able to listen to you a little bit better. Now we're going to change our perspective. Moving from the academia and the early warning systems, we are going to move to multilateralism. And one of the most important impacts of droughts, it's true that the impacts of droughts sometimes are difficult to monitor, to measure, to assess, because they happen slowly over time. But one of the most obvious impacts that we've talked about before this morning is the impact that it can have in terms of food security and the production of uh, food, especially in the most vulnerable communities where it can pro uh, cause famine and deaths. We have the Deputy Director of FAO with us today, the goal of which is to ensure food uh, security for all. Could you please give us some hints, some of the key aspects uh, of what FAO does in order to help countries to face the impacts of droughts? and the challenges it, uh, it generates. As a moderator, I need to control, um, to be in control of time, so if you could be, please, as much concise as possible with some just hints. My apologies for my portugnol. I am I would like to thank uh, the Vice President and the Minister for the Ecological Transition for inviting FAO to join this celebration and wish a happy desertification and drought day 2022 to all of you. As you said, I am from a country. The name of my country is Cabo Verde, Cape Verde, which is not green at all. Mm -hmm. We have a story of droughts. And 70 years ago, uh, eight, late 40s, we have a severe drought. And due to this severe drought, people die. And the ones who survive, they had to emigrate. It's, it's a bit of the story we saw in the last video. Today, 70 years after, we are still having droughts, but no one is dying due to drought. Why? Why? Because we learn how to transform drought in emergency in working more on sustainable solutions to drought management. And this is what FAO does indeed. As you said, today we have more than 800 million people suffering from uh, food insecurity. And one of the causes is climate change, drought, or floods. And uh, another part is conflict, but the main part is due to that. We uh, at FAO, we look food security that requires a transformational 
change where we, addra we address drought on top of the actions of climate change, as I said, which is increasing the frequency and the, the intensity. It has also been said today. Our priority in FAO is to have a paradigm shift. From what? From a very costly emergency and reactive response to a cost-effective, proactive, and integrated approach in drought management. This meaning that drought management will be part of the policies, will be part of the program, will be integrated in all development plan of the counters. How we do it? We have three main elements. The first one is have a multi-sector drought management. Drought doesn't affect only crop, affect livestock, affect water, soils, sustainable natural resources management. We need to have a plan where they are all part of the plan. They are not, we don't look at them as silos. Then, looking at this uh, integrated approach, we try to establish proactive plans. I can give you an example. In Afghanistan, they have drought. 10.5 million people were affected by drought. FAO worked with Afghanistan to develop a strategic plan. The plan has four pillars. The first pillar was the integrated, it was a multi-sectoral uh, approach with agriculture, livestock, natural resources management, water and irrigation, and disaster management. The first pillar was to strengthen drought risk governance, how we manage the risk. The second one is Im improve drought vulnerability and risk assessment. The third one was to strengthen drought early warning, early action and monitoring, as the previous speaker has just mentioned. And the third pillar was increasing investment in drought. How we transform this plan in a resource mobilization element. And this was assumed by the president and they were able in Afghanistan to use this plan to mobilize resources. And now this plan has been financed by the World Bank and they can plan and they can be uh, more uh, proactive and resilient to drought. Based on this experience, FAO with UNCCD, we worked in 32 countries to develop drought and national action plan. Today, 12 of them have been financed and we hope we can continue in this, uh, bringing the, the global environment uh, facility, the, global, the, the green climate fund to finance those plans. The second element is financing in investing in drought risk assessment. We are talking, talking about risk. It's not easy to have investment or financing to manage risk. We need all of us as, uh, in the multilateral system to give a priority to invest and finance risk and to bring the private sector, which is not easy but we need to, we have some investments and in how we can uh, set up some mechanisms in terms of insurance, other uh, instruments. And now we need to enhance investment in drought prone countries that will also ensure the highest effectiveness for the most vulnerable communities and livelihoods. The third element is invest in technical solution, innovation, and information system. We talk today about the need to have an information system. And what tools we are talking about? We are talking about drought management, knowledge, and practical solutions. FAO, we have what we call the global information and early warning system on food and agriculture. With these elements, we have the ground information, but we have the satellite information. We know that a country will have a drought. We know what are the reserves in the country 
We know the trade and we can take tell a country, a drought is come, you don't have enough reserve, you need to take early action. And this is also how we can provide early action solution. And also we have what we call agriculture stress index system. We are implementing in Salvador and Guatemala. But if we know that we have a drought coming, and I tell you that today we have 1.2 billion people living in dry lands, and it's critical for them to be prepared. What we help to them is to adopt salt-tolerant crops, is to adopt, adopt crops that they are short cycle and they don't need so water, and how they can also have a sustainable management, having more efficiency in managing the water, in having also a pr appropriate soil, manage, soil management, as the, the colleague from Tunisia refer, FAO work with the Global Soil Partnership, you help with uh, soil map and uh, soil solutions. And we have also some technologies. We work with uh, community knowledge technologies to transform them in innovation. I don't know if you heard about the half moons in the Sahel. Yeah. The half moons, they were done by the local communities. Nowadays, it's done in a mechanized way where okay. we can store water and we can have production. And with this, we can increase the production, we can reduce the vulnerability, we can support women, as it has been said, they are the most affected by, by drought, and we can enhance livelihoods and address the impacts of drought. We have some examples also in, in Spain. You have the Deazas, the Deazas, the Deazas. <laughs> now I think is the best pronunciation. Deazas in Spain, where you have a mix crop and livestock systems, and they are based on short season drought resilient crop and resident flood waters. I stop here. I know I don't have much time, I can give you a lot of uh, several examples, but I want it to be practical to tell you that today we know the solutions, they are there, we need to scale them up, and we need to have the consequent investment. I wanted to take about, talk about land restoration that is important, how to restore degraded land to become productive land. Ibrahim talked in, in, in the opening speech. I don't think I need to repeat, repeat what he has said. Thank you, Elena. Thank you very much for this great amount of examples in different parts of the world, including the DESAs in Spain. I think there are several elements that have been put up on the table right now. We're talking about knowledge. Uh, participation of stakeholders, governance, and I would like to add more points of view to this roundtable thanks to our next speaker. So we're going to welcome Skumsa Nsanga, and um, she's not just the Deputy Director General of Biodiversity and Conservation Branch in the Ministry of Forest, Fisheries and Environment of South Africa, she's also been part of the Intergovernmental Work Group on Draft that has been established by the United Nations uh, Convention against the certification and draft and they just presented the results of their work a group in Abidjan in COP15 just a month ago and the conclusions of this working group was a call to action for all countries and my question here due to the fact that in your country you have a lot of experience uh, regarding the risk of draft are you listening to the translation I don't know it's not easy to have different languages in the room, sorry. But nonetheless, what we were trying to say is my question for you would be, how does South Africa, or how is South Africa getting ready to mitigate the effects of draft at the same time as promoting sustainable development, uh, doing a better use of the resources and the land in the country? What are the main hurdles that you're finding in your way in order to achieve your targets? Madam uh, Facilitator, mm. and it's an honor and a privilege for me to participate mm. in this August uh, platform. Um, 
I think as has been reflected uh, earlier, the African region is affected the most uh, by the severe drought with more than 300 recorded events in the past 100 years, accounting for more than 44% of the global total natural uh, disasters. And um, the young lady from Kenya said it all earlier when she spoke uh, with so much uh, a passion. So I'm not going to get into the African context. Uh, but just to indicate that uh, drought is a major issue for South Africa, we are also not spared in terms of the total economic losses and the number of people who get affected on a daily basis. It's got devastating economic, environmental and social impacts such as loss of life, food and energy insecurity, reduced agricultural productivity and degradation of the natural resource base, which unfortunately underpins all life on land. And the ability to reduce vulnerability to drought, to improve resilience and coping mechanism depends on a number of factors, including the availability of uh, the scarce water and other natural resources, alternative livelihoods, financial resources, and a number of and, sorry, and advance the early warning systems. And as you might be aware, South Africa has since 2014 experienced the worst drought in decades, which continues to affect all sectors of the society, especially our vulnerable communities, including women and the youth. Drought in South Africa, as in many parts of the world, is therefore a cross-cutting cross issue uh, that has a devastating impact on various sectors such as the water, energy, biodiversity, agriculture, human health, and affects socioeconomic conditions of its inhabitants. Hence, our government approach has been to facilitate an integrated and intergovernmental response at a national level. And this is part of institutional governance of, of drought and in this regard, an interministerial task team on drought and water security was established to, amongst others, coordinate um, the different sectors and stakeholders in terms of drought interventions to also ensure mobilization of resources, both human and financial, in order to deal with drought, as well as to update parliament and cabinet on drought activities across the country. And this is very important in terms of enhancing a political will. The work of the interministerial committee supported at a strategic and technical level by, amongst others, the National Joint Drought Coordinating Committee, as well as the National Coordinating Body for the implementation of the UNCCD in the country. The focus of both committees is to ensure policy development as well as implementation. So they focus on both levels, the policy side as well as the implementation side. And some of the measures uh, that I would like to share with you this afternoon uh, in respect of mitigation of drought whilst promoting sustainable development and improving productivity of land include the fact that we have developed various cross-cutting policy tools that are nested in our constitutional obligations, such as the robust legislation that we have for different sectors, uh, including recently the draft, draft climate change bill, uh, which is being finalized in parliament in order to enable for the development of an effective climate change response and a long-term just transition to a low carbon and climate resilient economy. We have also developed the National Water Resource Strategy that has undergone several iterations in order to ensure that our water resources are protected, used, developed, and controlled in an efficient and sustainable as well as equitable manner 
towards achieving our development priorities, especially given the fact that South Africa is a water scarce country. And in this regard, I would just like to mention that we have also established that we have about 22 of what we call our water factories. Uh -huh. And these are above ground um, water resources that cover about 10% of South Africa's surface area, but contribute immensely, especially in terms of providing our much needed uh, water resources to 60% of, more than 60% of the population and also accounting for more than 70% of our economic activity uh, as a country. So these strategic water source areas are very important and government um, is hard at work in terms of ensuring that we secure these uh, in the short to medium term. We also have quite a number of other um, policy related tools, including the National Biodiversity Strategy and Action Plan in compliance with our obligations under the Convention on Biological Diversity with a short to medium term a tool which we call a national biodiversity framework which was approved recently by cabinet. So we try to ensure that there is political will um, by making sure that all of these tools that we develop um, enjoy the support of our political principles. Okay. And um, we have also, um, in the energy front, developed an integrated energy resource plan, which aims to ensure security of supply while minimizing negative emissions and water usage, amongst others. We have also developed, um, given the land degradation drought nexus, uh, with healthy soils providing a buffer in terms of times of drought, our land degradation neutrality targets have also been in place since 2018 and we are working in earnest towards the achievement, uh, their achievement by 2030 in support of the National Action okay. Program to combat uh, desertification, land degradation and drought. We have also developed the UNCCD drought response strategy with short, medium and long term targets and a more holistic and integrated national drought plan which is led by our sister department responsible for cooperative governance and traditional affairs. And this okay. is aimed at promoting a paradigm shift from reactive to proactive approach. Uh, we have many other tools that I cannot list uh, in this forum, including our national climate change adaptation strategy. Um, however, I just want to mention that at an operational level, we have various labor intensive expanded public works programs that are in place, such as land care and the famous uh, working for uh, programs, including working, working on fire, working okay. for wetlands, working for water, which have really assisted us in terms of enhancing our conservation of biodiversity as well as land resources, um, and also ensuring land rehabilitation and restoration okay whilst at the same time focusing on public employment at scale, ensuring okay. food and energy security, as well as supporting skills development, as well as enterprise development as well. Okay. And we have quite a number of other on the ground interventions, including providing support infrastructure and funds for farmers, technical support to vulnerable municipalities and communities, increasing the promotion of health and disease surveillance, as well as disbursement of funding for okay. drought relief. We are proud that in this regard, we have invested in excess of 13 million US dollars in the drought relief intervention project, bringing 65% of the total 2,000 water tanks into serviceable okay. use. And we can see the private sector also coming on board uh, in a big way in terms of supporting our drought and water um, a resilience um, a efforts. As well. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for this comprehensive uh, explanation of, on the one hand, the policy side and the operational side. Um, 
After this very comprehensive view of what is going on at a national and international level, we've seen some of the aspects of science. I think we have time for a second round of questions, but I just wanted to take the opportunity to ask you Based on what has been published in the newspapers recently, this is something that affects all of us. And it might be interesting to add this dimension to know what is your opinion about this. I remember that I work uh, doing surveillance of projects, and when I was doing the, giving back the feedback, they told us, no, tell us, don't tell us to improve coordination. Coordination can always be improved. You have infinite amount of room to do that. But in order to be efficient, we do need to improve coordination to include all the different stakeholders so we can have political will but also operational point of view. And so in my last question, my last round of questions, I wanted to ask all of you, how can we improve coordination between the policies that we have at a global, national and regional and local level? What are the coordinating mechanisms that we should have in place at every single one of these levels. Mark, please, could you be the first one to answer this question? Yeah, thank you, Elena. Um, yeah, this is a, a lot to unpack, right? Uh, drought does not discriminate uh, who it affects, which sector it affects, and it's certainly uh, an, issue uh, an issue within, within country, country, but also, also transboundary trans issues in between countries and between, countries between, between basins, basins, basins and how we manage water, water and how we manage, and how we manage healthy, healthy soils. soils. So, so I think I, I go, go back to what I mentioned, what I mentioned earlier. earlier. To me, to it's, it's about, about tailoring, tailoring uh, uh, how you how package, package information, information for these various groups. groups. It's very critical because the needs are different at the local scale. And as we we like to say, all droughts are local. Meaning, meaning that that, that context, context at the local level is very important. So, so how, we how we package the information at that local, local level may be very different, different than for a national policymaker when you're w working with decision makers or resource managers on the ground, uh, agricultural producers, farmers, ranchers, different needs. And so the information isn't a one size fits all. Uh, and, 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 you know, drought's challenging because there are many different types of drought. And, and so, yes, coordination is important, and we, we like to say that. But, you know, there are efforts underway through the st strategy of the UNCCD, FAO, WMO, uh, some of the joint efforts more recently, the Integrated Drought Management Program, uh, working with World Bank and other partners, are at least now on the same page with this three-pillar approach and being proactive instead of reactive. So I think we're making really good progress there. I think the next the next step is getting that into planning processes and mitigation actions all the way down to the local level and and from the ground up i mean most of the best things come from the ground up not the top down uh, when it comes to tools and data so i think there's lots of cases we've heard from uh, the the prior speakers here in this panel uh, at the local and, and country level that i think we can integrate and learn from best cases around the world by putting and sharing these uh, case studies on how people are dealing with drought in the context of a, of a climate change plan, a water plan, a comprehensive plan, whatever that standalone drought plan. And there are various mechanisms now to help support uh, people do just that through the partners that I mentioned earlier. Thank you. already existing and what we need maybe is to strengthen the existing mechanism. I can refer to the intergovernment working group under the mandate of UNCCD that uh, work with the countries to support countries to develop their national drought management plans according to different principles of integrated drought management, as we said, to be proactive. In COP15, it was said that it will be strengthened to include a focus on financing for drought risk is very important, as I, I refer in uh, my intervention. 
we, ha we can, as I said, we cannot see drought on isolation. We have the three Rio conventions. We have when the Convention on Desertification on Biologic Diversity on Climate Change. And it was clear in Stockholm that we need, and also in Abidjan, to need in a more integrated way. They cannot be seen on isolation. We need to bring the financing entities, the Green Climate Fund, the GEF, the Adaptation Fund, the World Bank, to really finance drought and drought-prone activities. We need also to go to regional level. We have already the regional existing institution. We have in Africa, we have several with link to African Union. We have others in the different region. How in their plans and their policies they should integrate drought and the other uh, connection. But more than that is how we coordinate at the country level with the government. That they have the adequate policies that to refer to the uh, smallholders, to the pastoralists, to the herders, to women, youth, that we look at drought in a multi-sector multi -sectoral approach and all the actors, they should be part of, of the solution. And this really, in my view, drought doesn't have borders, doesn't have frontiers. We need to work together at all le levels and to scale up the existing solutions. And this is, those are the mechanisms we really need in order to work. In FAO, we work very close with UNCCD. We work very close with UNEP, who are the co-leaders of the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration, but others, UN uh, uh, entities at the country, global, and also regional level. But more than that, our work with the countries at the ground level is where we can transform and where we can have the shift we want to have in drought, not be looked at an emergency, but part of a sustainable development. Yes, thank you. The climate emergency, the land degradation and drought is in itself part of one single big crisis, part of a system that needs to be changed and a shift of paradigm that we need in order to keep on working and for that reason we need specific complex responses to the situation, including all the different stakeholders. What are your views on this issue of coordination? Drought um, is an enemy mm. to sustainable development, and therefore we have to deal with it decisively with every tool we have and at every level, at a national level, at a regional level, at a global level. And I think that at a national level, I think as the, my colleague from FAO has indicated, a whole of society approach uh, is needed involving all sectors of the economy, all spheres of government, the private sector, non-governmental organization, communities, farmers, consumers, women and youth. So we need that integrated approach. And I think at a regional level, we should make use of the existing regional institutions uh, that have already been working on issues relating to drought and, and, and climate change and ensure that the early warning systems cut across the boundaries of the different countries uh, at a regional level. Um, I am quite confident uh, that the new intergovernmental working group on drought, which was agreed upon in the recent COP in Abidjan, we leave no stone unturned in terms of presenting us with some policy options on how to deal with drought decisively under the, the convention. And we are hoping that they will identify and evaluate all available policy options, including global instruments, as well as a, a regional framework. I think lastly, um, we are at crossroads and I think we can either continue believing that the marginal change uh, that we have been seeing over a period of time can heal the systematic failures 
uh, or we can decide to take a quantum leap towards long-term transformative change and full global commitment and international solidarity to drought preparedness and resilience is therefore necessary and part of that requires a political will and agreement uh, on a more holistic uh, policy framework. Thank you. Muchas gracias. Thank you. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much. Out of the different ideas that we've mentioned here today, I think there's one key one, which is that transformation. Because after all, this transformation, it's uh, what is moving us towards a true change, not small change, but we're at a moment when we need a bigger transformation. And that will be the way in which we will be able to face this common enemy, as you call it dropped our enemy. Thank you very much. I'm extremely sorry that we do not have any more time. I wish we could keep on talking about this with all of you, and I wish I could have asked many more questions. Hopefully, we will be able to discuss about this uh, later on. But don't leave the floor, because we still have another speaker. We're extremely happy to have our final speaker today, which will be Monica Medina. She's a assistant Secretary for the Bureau of Oceans and International Environmental and Scientific Affairs of the U.S. Department of State. She's not here with us, but she has sent us a video to be part of this very important and relevant day. Please do play the video. Today, Today, on Desertification, on desertification and drought, and drought day, day, I commend, I commend all, of all of you for your efforts, efforts to, address to address this growing, this growing challenge. challenge. Individuals, Individuals communities, communities, and governments, and governments must, must act to combat, to combat desertification, desertification and, drought and drought around the world, the world and build, build long-term long resilience. resilience. We know, we know that, that climate change is decreasing, decreasing food, food production globally. globally. The Intergovernmental, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate, climate change, change has said that on our current path, as much as 30% of the current agricultural lands could be unsustainable for farming by the end of the century. And we cannot address land degradation without innovative management practices, such as protecting rangelands from overgrazing and maintaining cover on croplands during droughts. We must find solutions. People's lives today depend on it. One person, One person every 48, 48 seconds, seconds is likely, is likely dying, dying of hunger in parts of Africa, Africa according, according to a recent, to a recent report. report. In the United, in the United States, States, we are working, we are working to, to minimize, minimize overgrazing on public, public rangelands through, through an approach that provides, provides long-term long leases, leases on millions of hectares of, hectares of land. land. To discourage, to discourage tillage, tillage of highly, highly erodible, erodible lands by, by limiting access, access to agricultural, agricultural support programs, programs for those for lands. lands. To promote, to promote the maintenance, the maintenance of perennial, perennial cover, cover on highly, highly erodible lands, lands. And, to and to provide assistance, assistance to, farmers to farmers and ranchers, and ranchers for soil, soil conservation, conservation planning. planning. And, through and through the work, the work of the United States, States Department of State, State and the U.S. And Agency, Agency for International, International Development, Development, the U.S. US supports, supports implementation, implementation of these strategies across, across the globe. The globe. We also we need also to shift, shift planning, planning horizons. horizons. These, These issues will be will with be us for the long run, run and we need to get ahead of the curve. curve. We, must we must all think long term and find, and find innovative, innovative ways, ways to reduce, reduce drought, drought instead of just responding to the devastating, to devastating impacts, impacts caused by drought. By drought. We, need we need to act, act before, before the damage, the damage is, done. is done. That's why, That's why we, we encourage governments around the world to develop their own, their own land, planning land planning processes, processes and, provide and provide funding, funding to implement, implement climate, climate smart, smart agricultural policies, policies before, before drought, drought hits. hits. Using, Using data, data to improve, improve, drought improve drought forecasting is a key, is a key pillar, pillar of our approach, of our approach under, under the recently, recently released White House, White House Action Plan on Global, on global water, water Security. security. We, know we know that these that policies, policies will look different, different country by country. country. By country. That is that why is we why need to we share best, best practices, practices what's, what's worked for each of you, you and take, take home new ideas, ideas to address, address desertification, desertification and, drought. and drought. The health, the health of, our, of people our people and our planet, and our planet relies, relies on, it. on it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for this last intervention. 
And now I'm going to close this round table by thanking you for all your contributions, for all the ideas that we put on the table uh, related to the complexities of climate crisis, including the certification, but also others, and also related to the necessary transformation to face them, and also in terms of the call for action. Thank you, and thank you all to all the attendees uh, for being here or from listening to us from home. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, in order to close the event, we will give the floor to Ibrahim Tio, Executive Secretary of the United Nations Convention to Combat the Certification. Wow, what a day, what a day. So this is, I will be very brief because you have been listening and interacting amongst yourselves. First of all, thanking the government of Spain, the prime minister, deputy prime minister, and all the ministers that were here today, the ambassadors who were with us, and every, each and every one of you, those who are in the room and those who are connected and those who are were unable to join us physically and still connected by video. Mark, thank you very much for your participation. I would like to just say a few words. As illustrated in the discussions we just had in the last panel, drought is not an, issue, an easy issue to deal with. It is affecting many communities. It is very difficult to coordinate intersectoral uh, issues. It affects multiple scales, regional, sub-regional, national, and some, sometimes even global. Uh, it requires funding. It requires good coordination, good planning. So it is not easy to deal with. If it was easy, we would not have faced the situation that we are in today. But because it is difficult, but because it is having a serious impact on our economy, on our health, on our security, on our food production. And because it is affecting more and more people in the world, up to three quarters of humanity may be affected by 2050. This is precisely the reason why we should act. This is precisely the reason why we should change the paradigm. We need to rethink because the way we have been dealing with drought so far has not been that effective in most parts of the world. So it is very important, and as Monica Medina just uh, said, the Assistant Secretary of State, we will need to embed this into our national policies as well as global policies of international cooperation. So again, thank you very much to all that were in the room. Thank you very much to all those who were connected, and thank you to the millions of people, hundreds of millions of people from around the world that have celebrated, that are still celebrating this day. We, you can see uh, in the social media, you can see in the national presses, you can see the videos coming. It is a very important day for us. But are we done? 
No, we are not done yet. We have just scratched the surface about drought. We, we need to act and we need action. And when we say we, I mean we with a capital W. Each and everyone, not only governments, not only private sector, not only local authorities, but we as citizens also have a role to play. And there's no small action. As I said in my, in my opening remarks, there is only inaction. Do you want to be part of the action or, or part of the inaction? Thank you very much again. Muchísimas gracias a, a los Thank you very much to the panelists, to the participants, the moderators, and thank you all for attending this event. With this last speech, we conclude the World Day to Combat Desertification and Droughts. Thank you very much and good evening. Muchas gracias.